right, question number one. Now, someone asked, how do we respond? All right, how do we respond? And I think this is, can be a common experience for many. How do we respond to someone who says that they previously were Presbyterians and knew God's word, but until they had the experience with God, their obedience to God was without joy, and they didn't do it from their heart. I repeat, how do you respond to someone who says that they were previously Presbyterians and knew God's word, but until then, until when they had an experience with God, their experience with God, their obedience to God was without joy and they didn't do it from their heart. How do you answer someone who comes up to you? They know you attend a Presbyterian church. So I used to attend Presbyterian church and uh, you know I was taught God's word. I knew God's word. Oh, but until, you know, one day when I had experience with God, means that previously means they're no longer in the Presbyterian church, right? I had an experience with God and, you know, until I had that experience with God, when I was in a Presbyterian church and knew God's doctrines, my obedience to God was without joy and I didn't do it from the heart. How do you, ex how do you respond to someone like that? All right, maybe just quick, some quick samples. Some quick samples. Okay, so your child comes back from school and asks daddy that. Oh, which daddy? Maybe these are probably grown up, all right? Grown up. So ask, uh, ah, ask Alex, all right? Define experience, all right? The first thing you look at the child, define experience. <laughs> the child say, oh, daddy, next time I don't ask you any questions. <laughs> So how will I know my friend said that? But that's a good place to start. A very important place to start. So in your case, this person is asking you on the spot in school or at work. All right? Then you ask, mm, a defined experience. I noticed you didn't say defined Presbyterian <laughs> since you've learned it on Friday. Define experience. Now, why do you want him to define experience when your colleague is telling you that? Experience can come and go, and what really is that experience, all right? Yes, yeah, so the first thing is, ask the person. Ask the person, what is that experience now? So a few scenarios is possible, all right? So maybe you face that, or maybe you yourself is wondering about that. I've been in a BP church for a long time. Yeah, that's true, you know. My experience, my obedience to God is without joy, and I don't do it from my heart. Now, first scenario, it could be the person was not saved in the first place. So the experience could be a salvific experience, a salvation. Before that, yes, you hear God's word. Yeah, you attend the Presbyterian church. Now, in fact, this can happen in any church, any denomination. You were not saved in the first place. Then one day, you had the experience meaning to say you got saved. Prior to that, you were forced to believe by your parents, forced to go to church by parents. You just don't like all these things. Then you got saved. It could be that. All right, it could be that. Now, what else? It could also be maybe there was something wrong in that church in the way it was teaching the word, right? So it could be taught wrongly. It could be the other person said, I knew God's word, but he may not know God's word in the right way. He may misunderstand God's word, right? He may not have been taught about the love of God. I know, I know God's word, but you have not been understanding the infinite love of God. So it could be that as well. And it could happen in any church, okay? Now, but it could also be... Now, one of the things that we have to remember, and we must say it up front, every Christian, whatever denomination you may be from, let us not mince our words. Every Christian, and let it be known that in this church it is taught as well, must obey God from the heart. Young ones, teenagers, preteens, don't obey God out of being compelled. You feel you're compelled by your parents to come, 
compelled by your parents to pray, compelled by your parents to read the Bible. Don't link it to uh, because we are Presbyterians. Always remember, those are all the commandments given by God for your good. So please remember that. It is one of our prayer items, weekly prayer item in our monthly prayer um, item list, right? That the children obey God. They understand that they be godly seed, not because their parents want them to be. But teens, listen. It is not your parents that want you to be godly seed. Yes, they want. But ultimately, it is God. God said he seeks godly seed in the home. So you must remember that. For the adults, likewise. You must always obey God from your heart. When you don't, yes, this will happen. There's no joy. There's no joy. Now, but why do people sometimes bring up the Presbyterian church? I can tell you that people bring up Baptists as well and so on. But now one of the things about the Presbyterians, as you would know, Presbyterians are known, or rather the Reformed faith. The Reformed faith is known to be a denomination that focuses very much on the word. Exegesis of the word, verse by verse, word by word, precept upon precept, because it's in scriptures. God says precept upon precept. It's a, it's a, it's a denomination that focuses mainly on teaching the word, number one. Number two, it, has, it is very clear on its creeds, C-R-E-E-D-S, its creeds. Very clear statements of our beliefs. Westminster Confession, for example. You know, historically, we've studied that. Why did they need to come up with creeds that are so long, so specific, so exacting? And every point that they make, they support, with, support it with many Bible verses. Presbyterians are known for that. They did that because there were errors that they had to fight against in England, in Europe. So they want to state very clearly from scriptures what the faith should be about. Now, as a result, in there, there are many things that will cover the Christian living. For example, the next question is about the Ten Commandments, about hatred. Even just for each commandment, they give you lots of examples from scriptures. What we should do, what we should not do. Now, because the Presbyterian faith, or rather, I would say the Reformer faith, is, the, this is, this is characteristic of the Reformed faith. You go to church, you will keep hearing the word, the word, the word. You will keep hearing, don't do this, do that, because it's in the word. You can't avoid it. No fluffy, please you, make you happy, just sing, sing songs, mainly singing songs and go home. No. A big part is the word, because it's biblical. Because of that, people may tend, especially when you are backslided, may tend to dislike the Presbyterian, or I would say the Reformed faith. If you go to church wanting experience, you will not like the Presbyterian or the Reformed faith churches. It's not going to have colourful lights, music that makes you want to jump up and down and scream, you're not going to have that. So it tends to be a denomination in particular that would, be, that would make people feel that there is no joy. Now, it's a miss and no joy. And no, they don't obey from the heart. This can't be further from the truth because the heart of the Reformed faith is one of a martyr's faith. Why do I say that? When the, when the Protestants broke away, or when Christians broke away from the Roman Catholic Church, that is where the Reformed faith started. Reformed faith is, is not a man-made thing, all right? It's just simply a name given to a system of, of faith that is based upon scriptures. Well, it's called reform because they reform the corrupted church. That's why it's called the Reformed faith. It's not a new kind of faith. It's just going back to the biblical faith that reformed, reformed 
the original New Testament church. That's why it's called the Reformed faith. So don't think Reformed means man made something else. The Reformed faith started and in order to keep the truth. We know that we still have the scripture and the truth became clear again after a period of darkness was because people died for it. Denounce disbelief or we'll kill your child in front of you. Denounce that belief or we will cut off your arm and your legs. Denounce this or we burn you at the stake. Now you tell me, you tell me, which denomination went through all this? Is the Reformed faith. The Reformed faith, if it is not from the heart, will you die for something if it is not, some, if it is not a system of a systematic form of theology that, is, that moves the heart? You tell me. Who would die for something if it is not something that stirred their heart? That even in all this persecution, they rejoiced like the apostles. So, when men over historical period backslide, when the world becomes so ingrained in the Christian life, this could be one scenario. So much word, 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 word. No joy. I don't like it. Or it could be, well, you didn't tell me nicely. Right? Your preaching is very harsh. If you tell me nicely, then I'll do it. Then it's joy. So many scenarios. But I want you who are worshippers in BPCWA understand this. If you hear this, and if you agree with it, dispel that thinking. The martyrs of the faith were from the Reformed faith. These people love God and obeyed him with their lives, in their limbs, all right? So understand that. So now, then, what else? Now, it could be, it could be that the person just came out of backsliding. Could be understood something about God. That understood when he, when he was no longer in the Presbyterian church, that happened, then, then that is good. That is a good thing, all right? But don't blame your backsliding life on any denominational, well, sound denominational beliefs, all right? So remember that as a Christian. And don't fall into the idea that, yeah, Presbyterians, yeah, just, just, just very dry, very boring, it's all doctrines. Doctrines is what? Build convictions that cause people to be willing to die for their faith. It is from doctrines. Remember that, all right? Now, then another thing is this. I want to warn of the danger. The danger. Do we experience God first, then obey? Well, we have to talk about the definition of experience. So that is a good question. Now, in, in, in um, Christian history, there was a period where there was this movement, and it's called the Kesik Movement, K-E-S-W-I-C-K, all right? Kesik Movement. Now, that is a movement that started what is already made more, um, give more impetus to what is called the Holiness Movement, the Holiness Movement. You say, well, what's bad about that? Push a, a drive for holiness. What's so bad about that? Now, but this... This Kassik movement was, well, outwardly looks, looks very good, but was a very dangerous and deceptive movement. Because the emphasis was this. Yes, you get saved. But that is your first crisis in life. Crisis means a, a very significant point in your life. But it was, it was a big re so-called so revival going on all right, in Christian history. And these people, over time, began to say that there must be a second crisis in your life. And what is that? A certain experience with God. And from that experience, that then onwards, 
they experience this joy, this power, this sanctification, this holiness, this walk with God. After this second experience with God. Now, initially, people didn't notice that that was the problem. And over time, few things happened. Number one, kind of like there was a class. These are the people who had that experience. These are the group of people like, oh, I did not get that experience yet. And I need to seek that experience. So this whole thing about experience must be dealt with very carefully as a Christian. We're not saying that in a Christian walk, there is no experiences. There is an experiential faith. We say that. There's an objective faith. All the doctrines, theology, that is sound, you know, that you're unmovable in, that we must be unmovable in. The objective faith. But the objective faith spurs experiential faith. Like we learned this morning, you learn all the doctrines about prayer, but that is not the point. Doctrines are only the foundation, and you must have the right doctrines to now stir the experience of now, how do I stop worrying? So we're not saying that experience have no part in the Christian life, but when the experience is one that is like that, I'm dry, I'm, I'm down, God, can you, can you zap me? I see the Christian, what they experience that, and then after that, their life changed. I'm waiting for that life-changing, zapping moment of experience in my life. So questions like that, you have to also help your friend. Understand, now, what is he talking, or what she's talking about experience? Is this person talking about, at one point, I had an experience which the Presbyterians do not agree to? But the charismatic movement or certain segments of Christianity, they continue to say, oh, you must have that experience. So after that is joy. Not like this, this hymn singing, um, um, Bible preaching churches, you must have that experience. Now, if it is that, it is dangerous. And I hope that you don't as well go and look for that. No history. God says, no, the, the, the wows of the wicked one. That is what he did. And he calls... And Satan caused a lot of confusion in Christianity. And for example, D.L. Moody, some of you may read his book, right? He's a good Christian, right? God used him. But I believe, yeah, if I remember correctly, D.L. Moody, he's one of them who said, you know, he struggled with dryness in his life um, and, and so on. Then he said one day he was walking in the streets of New York in the back lane, and then he felt this heavy burden. He felt this heavy um, impression in his heart. And then he knelt down and prayed. And then he cried. And then he said from then onwards, his Christian life was different. Well, his salvation is different, but he's not talking about salvation. And then after that, many people sought that kind of experience. You don't read this kind of second blessing, so to speak. It's dangerous. Sometimes at church camps, well, I've attended a church camp before, it was like that. All of a sudden, a group of young people start crying. Start, then they became very emotional. And then they felt that they have an experience. Some of them walked with the Lord closely from what I managed to track, many of them no longer. Experience is not the test. In fact, this kind of Catholic experience, this Catholic holiness movement, very soon now gave credibility to the charismatic second blessing experience. You see the danger? Because in the charismatic movement, there is a second blessing post Salvation experience, whether it's, for example, tongue speaking. You must seek that. And when you get that, now you will experience the joy, you, you experience this freedom, you enter into a different level of walk with Christ. See, all these things are dangerous. Now, why dangerous? Because over time, experience, now experience are very addictive. Please know that. Doctrines are not, <laughs> unless you are, you are very sound in your, your understanding. Experiences are far more addictive than theology and doctrines. 
You may start off, and Satan is never concerned about you starting off obeying God. Now I want to obey God. I have joy. I pray more. I read the word more. I'm so excited to go to church. I long to serve God. I want to give my life to God. Now Satan is never afraid of that. If that stems from something that is just experience, and eventually he will use that to make you look for more experiences, stronger experiences. Meaning to say this, the Presbyterian reform focus on the word, the word, the word, the word becomes boring, tiresome, burdensome. Where is the experience? It becomes that eventually. Eventually, it becomes, I want to go where it's very lively, jumping, singing. If the word is not emphasized, it's okay because you have gone used, gotten used to this thinking that experience, joy, obeying from the heart is what you want. That is what you must want. But it did not start out of doctrines. Because every experience that you have that changes you must be because you saw in the Word of God who God is, what He has done, what His plans, His purposes are. That is what drove you and made you see God and your life on earth differently. It must Doctrines are what will soundly change and transform your life. But if you go, I know God's word, but I didn't have the experience. Until I experienced, then my obedience and my joy came. It's a very dangerous place to be. All right? And I want to emphasize again, knowing God's word is for the purpose of making you rejoice. Obedience of God's word must always be from the heart. But experience itself is no test. Because if we want to say that, there are also people that say this. I stopped becoming a Christian. Why? Because when I went to this other religion, whatever it is, I suddenly experienced this desire to be good, to be kind, to be honest, to have integrity in everything that I do. In a church, it's all just dry. But when I went to this temple, I had that experience. And from now on, I really, I really want to obey a God with joy, not like when I was in Christianity. What are you going to say? What are you going to say? You see, the truth the truth must be more important than experience. If you are feeling this, I know God's word. I'm in a Presbyterian church. My obedience is without joy. I don't, do, I don't obey God from my heart. Fix your heart. Unless the church are teaching, is teaching errors, doctrinal heresies. When you experience this, do not blame any denomination especially when the word is taught faithfully and it is there and you know God's word through that denomination. Fix your heart. Not go and look for an experience, not blame a denomination. All right, so always remember that if that occurs in your heart, you must be discerning. Don't fall into the wiles of the wicked one. He is not afraid of obedience. He is only afraid. Satan is only afraid of obedience that stemmed from knowing God's word. He is never afraid of obedience that stems from experience. Because over time, how you will change is this. You go by how you feel. For example, God says, don't marry unbelievers because they will take away your children from him. They will, they will cause you um, to struggle in your faith. God says that. But you will, because you got used to 
experience, then I obey with joy and obey from the heart. You fall in love with an unbeliever. Or maybe not. You fall in love with a carnal Christian, boldly. By evidence, not going to be a godly man, a godly father that will lead the family spiritually. But you say, you know, when I'm with him or when I'm with her, I feel, I feel like I really want to obey God. I feel like I really, wow, this is the first time I experience her. I really want to love someone the way God wants me to love this person because I feel it. When I'm with this godly, boring, square boy or girl, I don't feel these things, you know. But when I'm with this one, I feel it. I really want to obey God. But perceptively, by the word of God, you already know. Objectively, this is not a person, a, a, carnal, an, um, a carnal, unholy Christian, so to speak. It's not someone you should marry. No matter what you feel, that you want to now have a very godly marriage with him. It does not matter. It begins first with doctrines, with the word of God. So if you are someone who will fall into, you know, all this teaching, 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 I don't experience joy to obey God. It is a problem with your heart. It is not a problem with the word of God. Find what is that problem and fix it. All right? So I hope I, under, I under, answered this question because... Maybe in your heart as well. Maybe you get that all the time as well and you're beginning to wonder whether you are also going through the same thing. Remember Christ says, if any man love me, if any man love me, he will do my commandments, correct? There must always be love in obedience. But obedience, when you do not feel like doing it, you, said, you heard me say this many times, obedience, when you don't feel like obeying God and yet you obey, there may not be joy in your heart at that point of time. But you know what? That is true love. True love of a Christian towards God as Christ defined in John chapter 14, is if any man love me, he will keep my commandments. Means your proof of loving God is not your feelings, it's your obedience to the word. Remember that. Because there will be times you don't want to obey God. You don't want to follow that commandment because of lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life, whatever it is, because of fear. What was your test of, God, of loving God? I don't feel it, I don't want it, want to do it, but I will obey him. That is the definition of experience, experiencing love. Sometimes experiencing love for God is experiencing that you have no joy, but you still obey him. I've used this example hundreds of times. You tell your wife, I, at that moment when that lady tempted me, I didn't feel that I was in love with you. So I committed adultery with her. You understand, right? You can understand, right? Because my obedience to be faithful was without joy and I wasn't doing it from my heart, so I went ahead to commit adultery. Do you accept such a statement? Or would you want a spouse that say, when I was tempted, it was really very strong, the temptation. I really wanted to commit adultery. My heart loved her more than you, and I wanted her more than you. But I kept faithful to you regardless of how I was feeling. Is that love? Now, don't mix up love as experience. Love has experience, but it is not the only thing. All right? So I hope that you understand the Christian walk. Second question. Second question. If an unbeliever has gone through a sex change surgery earlier and came to know Christ, will he or she be able to get salvation after repentance as surgery is considered irreversible? All right, this was asked at 
church family camp, right? I say a church family camp is not teens Q&A, it's for, to ask about church matters, right? So we answer it here. So you know a Christian, or you know someone who got, underwent sex surgery change, then that was before salvation, then this person got saved and repent, but it's irreversible already. Will the person be saved? Means will the person go to heaven after he or she dies, okay? What do you think? What do you think, Noah? Okay, all right. So, um, as long as the person have truly, truly, right, the key word, truly, received Christ, believed in Him, turned to Him for forgiveness and salvation, that's, I guess, what it means. It's genuine. Then, whatever gender the person has changed to, all right, God still sees the person as his original gender or her original gender. God says, in Christ, there's no gender, all right? In God's eyes, you are his child, all right? You're his child. Gen because God says, whosoever believe in him should not perish. Whatever you have done in the past, as long as you have genuinely turned to Christ, confessing that you are a, you are a sinner, you have committed sins, and that you acknowledge there are sins and ask God to forgive those sins and save you and that you genuinely from heart because your belief is genuine that he is God you want to follow him you want to obey him no one can force you you want to you know that there's a genuine turning to God repentance in other words then you have you immediately transform from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light now turn with me to first Corinthians chapter 6 first Corinthians chapter 6 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Verse, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9. Verse 9. Now let's read from 9 to 12. All right? 9 to 12 reading. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus." and by the Spirit of our God. And all things, all things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful to, for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. Now, what is God saying? He used the past and the present tense. Now, all of us have committed one, if not all, if not many of these sins listed in verse 9. But God says that was, in verse 11, were some such were some of us. So, so what you have done before you were saved, does it matter after you're saved? That will affect your salvation if you, number verse 11, but ye are washed. Means if you turn to Christ, wash me of what I have done before salvation. I did not know it was a sin. Or I knew and I, don't, I did not care. I did not bother. Sin, so what? But Lord, please wash me. Forgive me. You are sanctified. Lord, make me positionally ready for heaven. Make me your child. This position of mine. As if I've not sinned before. That's why you can go to heaven. But you are justified. You see, it's not your, I'm not justified. God, I'm not asking to be justified by after, I get, after I'm saved, I change by my gender. I'm not justified by my works. I'm simply justified by the Lord Jesus Christ. His work. Yes, because there's something that I can never reverse. Don't you thank God that such justification is by God's grace? If justification is dependent on you, 
changing back. None of us can be saved. So God used past and present. But God says, now after you are saved, please don't give that excuse anymore. In verse 12, I will not be brought under the power of any. I will not continue in sin. Well, the sex change, you can't bring it back. How will you not continue in sin? You denounce that that is sin. Uh, sorry, you denounce that as sin. You tell people not to do it. The Apostle Paul killed, persecuted many Christians. And after he got saved, can he undo, resurrect the dead people that he killed? He could not. But he simply told people, I was the worst of the worst sinners. I persecuted and killed Christians. And he went around telling people to love Christians, to stand for Christians, to stand for Christ. Right? He will not continue in that anymore. Repentance. Repentance. All right? So, very straightforwardly, that is what it means. What are the spiritual lessons? Number one, please don't take sins lightly, even as a believer. What you do for some of the sins, there are always consequences for sins, and some may be irreversible. Don't take sins lightly, young people. Never mind, I'll just do this. Never mind, I'll just take that. Never mind, I'll just, I'll just go, go and do that with that person. Some sins have consequences that are irreversible. And then you always live with that burden, with that. Paul went through that. He always had that. Whenever he thought back, he felt so sorry. He felt so ashamed. There's no need for you to go through that. So young people, please, don't let a moment of, of lust, whatever it is in, you steal. You cheat in school. You get caught. That will always be part of your life. Understand that. So it's not just simply, well, I'm going to heaven, right? The sex change cannot reverse, but I'm still going to heaven. Please don't think like that. Paul says, after salvation, I will not be brought under the power of any. Remember that. If you're not saved, why are you not saved? If you're not saved, he said, maybe one day, one day I will believe. Remember this lesson as well. The other spiritual lesson is this. Now, by the way, I'm not saying now you go around proclaiming what you've committed as sin before you're saved, all right? I'm not saying that. Some private sins are private sins, all right? Now, then for the believer, please do not judge wickedly unbelievers, uh, people who have committed certain sins before they were saved. They were not saved. Some people, they go around, you know this person uh, um, used to go to this place, do that, and then do this, and then do that. Even before the person was saved, why do you want to do that? Right? Even after a person is saved, has repented, bore the consequences, have, have, have uh, borne the fruits of repentance. Don't keep bringing up those things. If God doesn't bring them up, why must you? All right? So, be careful. Now, next one. All right, so a young child, uh, I want to say young child, all right, younger one asks, why did, all right, let's turn to Matthew chapter 21. Matthew 21, verse 17. Matthew 21, verse 17. All right, quickly. Matthew 21, verse 17. Now, let's read together. And he left them and went out of the city into Bethany, and he lodged there. Now, this child asks, why did Jesus go to Bethany, sleep there, and in the morning return to Jerusalem? Okay? Now, it's good, right? As I wish we sometimes read the Bible like children. Every detail is important to them. They're curious. As a doubt, I just want to get this chapter done and then go to school, go to work. Right? They read. They really get into the whole event. They want to follow. They ask things. I always encourage you to do your devotion like that. All right? Pray for wisdom. That's where you learn the most. 
But don't try to be funny, all right? Ask, ask funny questions just to be funny. So he asked, you know, Jesus was in Jerusalem, then he went to Bethany, he slept there, and then in the morning returned to Jerusalem. Why don't you sleep in Jerusalem? <laughs> Isn't it interesting? Why? Why do you think so? No time to ask you, right? I'm running out of time. Now, I want you to turn to John chapter 11. Now, that is why you must read the Word of God consistently, read the Gospels, see the interrelationship of Gospels and the Bible as a whole. John chapter 11, verse 1. Let's read John chapter 11, verse 1. Now, a certain man was sick named Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary and her sister, Martha. It was where Lazarus, Martha, and Mary resided, in whose house the Lord found a resting place. Uh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> I know I, I was reading my own notes, right? So just John, John 11, verse 1. Now, the Bible tells us that it was the town of these very beloved believers in the Lord's life. The love, we know that the Lord has mentioned how much he loved them. So like a child, he said, you know, Daddy, why do we go home and sleep if you are coming back to church tomorrow? Why don't we sleep in church? <laughs> now, why? You know, the Bible tells us that the Lord found these believers in him to be people that he loved, that he, that he loved to be with. That he also found their love towards him. We read that in scriptures, how they constantly cared for him, provided for him, cooked for him. The Lord had work to do in Jerusalem. He needed a place to rest. He needed refreshing in order to continue his work the next day. His natural inclination, although it is, well, from what we check, right, it says that Bethany was nigh unto Jerusalem, about 15 furlongs off in John chapter 11. 15 furlongs off. Now, that would be about um, 3.2 kilometers. That would be maybe about 40 minutes walk. The Lord would rather walk 40 minutes there. Next morning, he intended to come back to Jerusalem, walk 40 minutes back. Yes, like the child wonder, he probably could look for some accommodations there, right? Maybe sleep in the forest, which he has done before. Sleep in a cave. Why? Oh, the, it's wonderful to read this. And then think of the spiritual lesson. Now, are you a Christian that is, so, that is known to be generous, kind, and that people experience this kind of hospitality, this kind of help for, from you, so that they can do God's work? So much so that there is this closeness, this kinship because of your support of one another that they would, they can rest, they long to walk all the way there, talk to you, have a blessed time of fellowship. Also know that you will help them to continue to do God's work and then walk 40 minutes back. Isn't it wonderful to be such Christians that the Lord himself experienced this kind of love? care, provision from. What are we? What kind of Christians are we to others? Does the Lord himself find that you're someone nice to be with in private? Those are the lessons we should learn. All right, so I hope I answer this child as well. From what we can see, this would most likely be the reason from what scriptures say about his feelings about this place because of the people. Okay, we have run out of time. We answer more questions the next time we return. Let us pray.